the housekeeping. All attendees are on mute and are requested to keep on mute. If you have any queries or any questions, please enter it in the chat box. If you are experiencing any technical glitch, please try exiting and rejoining the webinar. Data code, about data code, data code is a leading organization in the field of geoscience industry is bringing cutting edge technology and services to the industry, especially uh, to the growing Indian market for over more than over 25 years now. Our mission is to provide products and services that enable customers to excel in the business and thereby creating knowledge and wealth for the society at large. And our mantra is employment of end users, enhancement of employee skill sets and equity to all stakeholders. About Partners in Progress, it's a theme initiated with an objective to bring eminent speakers of geoscience domain and share their knowledge to the community. The sessions were designed with an intention to empower students and professionals from the industry and thereby creating a wealth of knowledge for the society at large. It is open for all and all students and professionals should attend this. Now, in line to that, today we have Mark Jessel with us, who is going to give a talk on his experiences on the Western African Explosion Initiative. Mark is a professor in University of Western Australia, fellow at the Center of Explosion Targeting at the University of Western Australia. Mark studied up to MS11 in UK, then moved to USA to do his PhD, went to Melbourne to do postdoc and take up a teaching and research position at Monash University. Then before moving to France, where he had a position with the Institute of Research for Development, and then he came back again to Australia to join University of Western Australia in Perth in 2013. His scientific interests in revolve around mis uh, microstructure studies, integration of geology and geophysics in 3D, the loop project, the Minex CRC projects, and the tectonics and metallogenesis of the West African and the Guinness Guinness cratons, the waxy and the sexy projects. His recently completed Western Australian Fellowship was focused on improving the links between the geological and geophysical data analysis in 3D via analysis of the geological and topological uncertainty. Currently, he is leading the Vexi and Sexy projects and co lead the project six of automated 3D geological modeling project of the Minex TRC with uh, Dr. Mark Lindsay. He is also involved in teaching microstructures and the geological interpretation of geophysical data sets. So I welcome Mark for today's presentation. A very warm welcome, Mark, and over to you. Thank you. And I'll just share my screen. Hopefully you can see that. Yeah. Great. OK, so uh, thanks everybody for joining us today and, and thanks for the data code team for in, inviting me uh, back again. Um, and what I'm going to be talking about today is very different from the last topic I talked about, which was 3D modeling. This time I'm talking about a research project that we've been running in West Africa for over 15 years now, and we're about to start the next phase of that uh, project. Uh, as the name of the project uh, implies, it's, it's focused on the on West Africa and in particular on the, the West African Craton. So um, in case, and I imagine that many of you may not be too familiar with the West African Craton, is this part of uh, West Africa that we can see in the map, and it's the part that's in color, which is within the, the bounds, the, the current bounds of that Craton. And it consists of two areas of Archean geology in um, purple and in uh, dark red, um, which are adjacent to two areas of Paleoproterozoic greenstone belt terrains. And um, these are overlain by Mesoproterozoic and Younger basins. And all of those have then been affected by um, Pan African age, so 600 million year age um, mobile ba belts along the margins. So that's the basic geology uh, uh, tectonics of the West African Craton. It's in terms of uh, what we're interested in, it's we're particularly interested in the Paleoproterozoic because it's been associated with uh, a large amount of, of mineral resources. 
over the years. And if we look at the um, total uh, gold production around the world, the, we can see that West Africa has been an increasing part of the story. It still is, is now one of the major destinations um, for um, gold exploration com companies around the world. And it has been for a long time. If we see, look at this uh, picture here, this is a picture of uh, Mansa Musa, uh, who in the um, in the uh, 1200s to 1300s was king of a region that included parts of what is now Mali. And we can see in this picture, he's holding a gold orb. And by many accounts, um, Mansa Musa was the richest person that's ever lived. And his wealth came from the, the gold resources within the, the Mali region, the extended Mali region. And that um, interest in the, the, the mineral uh, wealth of West Africa continued um, from that time and, and even before, all the way up to this first map that was produced by Henri Hubert, um, a French civil servant of the um, mineral occurrences um, in West Africa. And we can see all these black dots are various different um, important uh, uh, locations of mineralization in the region. And many of the deposits and the regions that were, we now know to be uh, rich in, in various different types of mineral deposits were already known back at that time. Um, so over oh, exactly 100 years ago this year. And um, from the, the beginning of the last century, there were significant um, uh, industrial mining activities. Here we see a, a map from 1904 of the southern part of the Ashanti Greenstone Belt in Ghana, or the Gold Coast as it was known then. And um, the, it's a pretty good map. If we look at a, a modern map, it's captured a lot of the, the important structures and uh, lithologies. And the same Henri Hubert, who produced the uh, mineral occurrence map, has produced a, a new map in 1934 that covered the whole of West Africa. And this was largely a result of his individual studies in many of the different regions. And if you squint your eyes, the, the overall distribution of the greenstone belts, the, the big granitic terrains, the sedimentary basins really hasn't changed all that much since 1934. Of course, the maps have got better and better, but the um, overall distribution of rock types has stayed about the same. And if we look at the, if we want to think about the, the mineral resources in this uh, in West Africa, we can um, think of the uh, bauxite deposits in um, this part of. Oops, let's choose. Not the, but let's choose something we should see. So we have bauxite deposits in in Guinea, and these are actually the largest uh, bauxite deposits in the world. We also have a, an overlapping area of of iron ore. Um, such as Samandu and other uh, well-known iron ore deposits. We have uh, diamonds in Sierra Leone and Liberia, and also some, some uh, diamonds in, in southern Ghana. Um, we have uh, a belt of copper, zinc, lead deposits running up through about here. Um, and then, um, just about everywhere in the Paleoproterozoic and the Archean, we have gold mineralization. So the area is, is uh, well endowed in terms of mineral deposits. And um, what I'm now going to talk about are some of the challenges that um, researchers and governments have faced in terms of understanding the tectonics of West Africa. Uh, and one of the challenges is that um, it covers a large area. The, the West African Craton is two and a half million square kilometers. So it's a, a, a decent sized area, uh, but it's a two and a half million square kilometers that are divided between uh, 12 or 13 countries. And those 12 or 13 countries 
um, speak a variety of different um, uh, administrative languages, so Arabic, French, English, Portuguese. And every country in this region of West Africa has at least one neighbor that speaks a different administrative language than um, itself. And so that results in difficulties in collaboration, difficulties in terminology. So different countries are using different types of terminology for the same um, stratigraphy, for example. And, um, you know, this is obviously uh, at least in part a result of the, the colonial era and the, the different countries, France and England in particular, taking over somewhat arbitrary um, divisions of the, the West African region. But if, in fact, if we look at the um, the local language distribution, it's, it's equally complex and, and equally um, scattered. And so the, the local languages in West Africa are not a solution to the problem of, of uh, communication across the region. So there's a language problem, and, and this results in very fragmented um, studies. Um, the second problem is a, a higher education problem. Here we see the number of students studying earth science in different um, institutions in West Africa. And we can see that some of these institutions have literally um, thousands of undergraduate students studying, and that puts a huge pressure on research capacity of the uh, researchers in the area. And when we look at the number of staff, we can see that there's really um, not that very many staff available in order to do the teaching in, in some of these countries. So that in order to develop research programs, there's a, a, a huge difficulty resulting from um, this um, um, huge undergraduate population who all want to study earth science. And so, of course, it's great that they want to study earth science, but in terms of running field trips and running labs, that's obviously a major challenge. And it's also a major challenge for the uh, academics in terms of their ability to undertake research. So that's kind of the background. And if we take a more philosophical look at the whole situation, um, we can compare the, the international extractive industry, which is very active in West Africa, and look at the, the value proposition for countries in West Africa of allowing um, international mining companies into the region. And so on the left hand side, we have a, a picture of the, the Rosebell mine in Suriname, so in, in South America, but uh, it's an open pit like many of them in, in West Africa. And so the country has a resource uh, that, it, that it owns, then that nobody disputes the ownership of that resource, so a gold within the ground. The international company wants to dig that out of the ground, such as this hole here, which means, of course, that the country doesn't have that resource anymore. And so there's a trade between the country and the company so that the country needs to be compensated by mining rents, taxes, employment, um, use of local uh, service companies, so that once the gold has gone, that there is a, a return on investment to the country itself. We can compare that with um, the same logic within uh, research organizations such as the university I work for, UWA, where West Africa is full of very interesting scientific problems. Um, but if we go in as researchers from outside and we solve these problems, then those problems are no longer available to be solved by the local research community. And so we strongly believe that by doing research in West Africa, we need to provide something back. And of course, we can't provide back mining rents or taxes or very much employment. But what we can do is help <coughs> with the local research organizations and, and government organizations to provide funds for them to undertake research and to provide training, uh, professional and, and student training that will allow them to develop their own research skills um, just as we do in, in our own country. So that logic of, of having going and working in West Africa is very much balanced, we hope, um, at least in part by our willingness to provide training and to provide research support for uh, West African geoscientists. 
And so that brings us to the, the Waxi project, which has been running for 15 years now, and we're about to start another three year phase of it. It's been run as a series of three um, phases so far. So we, we're talking about Waxi 4 at the moment. And um, it's brought in investment both from the minerals industry itself. So it's primarily funded by the international uh, mining industry, but it's also brought in money from uh, uh, governments in France and in Australia. And of course, the in-kind contributions of organizations like the university I work for that pays my salary. So that doesn't have to come out of the uh, costs of the project. Um, it's resulted in a, a decent number of publications by now, over 120, um, and it's involved a lot of different partners. And they're fundamentally the partners fall into three groups. They're the industry sponsors who get provide the funding and provide some access to data, but certainly access to deposits and to um, logistical support for regional studies. Um, they're the in-kind sponsors, which are the government agencies in West Africa, so the geological surveys and ministries of mines. And then there's the research and development partners, um, which are the universities in Africa, but also around the world. And as I've said before, the capacity building aspect of the project is very important. And over the last 15 years, we've we've trained more than 100 postdocs, PhD, masters and honours students, of which more than two thirds are from Africa itself, so that we're fulfilling that exchange of, of access to, to interesting scientific questions with support for, for local development. At the moment, WAXI covers about 12 countries in West Africa. And one of the things and one of the reasons that the companies and the geological surveys are interested in partnering with us is that over those 15 years, we've built up a large um, geoscience database of spatially um, attributed. So it's a large GIS that covers the whole of the West African Craton and contains more than 650 gigabytes of exploration geoscience data that's relevant to West Africa, but also to the rest of Africa. And, and there's some gl many global data sets as well. So this um, will show, I'll show you what this looks like uh, a bit later on. So in terms of how it's grown from starting from very small beginnings with a few partners, uh, uh, a limited number of students, and uh, of course, very few publications, we can see that over time it, it, it's grown significantly and hopefully during Waxy stage four, which is, as I said, is about to start, we're going to see a, a, another a surge in, in the number of students. Um, so in terms of, of what the major themes of WAXI are, so we started with the one that I've already talked about, the support for professional and research training via scholarships and high-end workshops. And we're now doing that in partnership with a not-for-profit that we set up called the Agate Project that provides direct research funding for PhDs and early career researchers based in Africa. Of course, there's a, a significant amount of uh, geological research looking at the greenstone belts and at larger craton scale architecture and inheritance questions. And uh, thirdly, there are a whole series of studies, both at the mine scale and more regionally, looking at the different mineral systems within the uh, Archean, the Paleoproterozoic, which is called the Brimian locally, uh, the uh, basins which cover these, and the uh, Pan African uh, uh, re reworking of all of the systems above. And then finally, we've got the um, more global questions relating to understanding what the tectonic setting was of the West African Graton. So the Waxi project, as I've said, has supported a, a pool of new geoscientists um, uh, working across the region. And, and we're very proud that some of these students, the yellow stars on this map here, are students that have gone on and, and have academic positions within West Africa, which means that they can be involved in training the next generation as well. 
We also do these professional courses. And so this was a course that we ran in uh, Cote d'Ivoire that was a combination of um, students from the university, industry professionals, geological survey members, um, and um, no, those are the three groups, I guess, that were at this particular course. And we, we give a whole series of, of courses on interpreting geology from geophysics, 3D modeling, geochemistry, using the latest uh, tools and techniques that allow um, professionals to build their build their um, CVs and build their knowledge base, allow students to inter interact with um, industry professionals and allow geological surveys to do the same. So in terms of sustain sustainability of the capacity building, um, we started off being uh, mainly carried out by the IRD, who I worked for in France. We then had a, a Luxembourg NGO that took over. And finally, we've now landed with this uh, independent uh, not-for-profit that's supporting all of this work in, and it's based in Australia, but obviously working in, in Africa. And these are some of the students that have uh, received research funding um, during the last couple of years. So if we look at the, the analysis of West Africa, we do it at, at multiple scales. Um, we're, we're looking at analysis at the, the scale of the whole craton, scale of greenstone belts, of individual deposits, and all the way down to the grain scale of single arsenopyrite grains within a, within a deposit. And one of the important things that we've been doing is harmonizing the stratigraphic analysis of the West African greenstone belts. And as I said before, there's many countries, there's different terminology, different languages. And so there's been a major work, and this is a, a series of um, 10 greenstone belts that cover the Ivory Coast, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, looking at the, it's harmonizing the analysis, harmonizing the terminology, and allowing us to compare all of these different belts, which often, even though they're telling similar stories are telling in detail quite different um, evolutionary cycles. They're classical Proterozoic greenstone belts, so they're starting with the mafix and then going to volcanics, volcanoclastic sediments, and then all the way up to terrestrial sediments. They lack the Kamatiites of the Archean systems, but otherwise they're very telling very similar stories. We've also done a series of, of geophysical experiments and if we um, look at this example here, this is a magnetotelluric survey that we carried out across um, Ghana and, and Burkina Faso. So it's about a 300 kilometer long survey that um, goes down 300 kilometers into the uh, lithosphere and even beyond. And the, the important things that we got out of this was that we could correlate surface structures that we, that we could identify from our mapping with these deep uh, dipping electrical features demonstrating the um, importance and the um, scale of some of the surface structures as being structures that go all the way through the crust and into the mantle, the lithospheric mantle. At the same time, there are certain places such as Western uh, Ghana where we can see their major jumps in the um, level of the base of the lithosphere, so the base of the lithosphere is, is somewhere like this over in the west and somewhere like this over in the east. So there's uh, major breaks in, in the uh, lithosphere in this region. So we've also done a lot of work with uh, geophysical inversions. This is some work carried out by Louis Gallardo. This, these are 26 integrated gravity mag versions across the whole of Burkina Faso. Um, so they're showing both the gravity and magnetic inversions, but uh, carried out jointly. And on the right hand side, we have a, a gravity inversion for Southwest Ghana. A large part. From these, we've also gone and made uh, 3D geological models of the scale of Freighton in the top right hand side, uh, at the scale of uh, the southern part of the Craton in the bottom right hand side and at the scale of southwest Ghana, showing us the Ashanti belt. 
which was that same geological map that I showed you at the very beginning of this talk. So these sort of 3D models are helpful in constraining our ideas about the relationships between these major structures, being able to map at the surface and at depth with the geophysics, and have shown helped us to identify the major breaks in the, the geology, which are both potential fluid pathways, but also potentially breaking up the, the craton into a different domain with different stories. We can do this with the geophysics and with the surface mapping. We can also do this with the isotope geochemistry work, and this is the work of Nicolas Thibault and colleagues. By this map, the yellow dots are, are gold deposits. The uh, background colors relate to the hafnium, the epsilon hafnium data over the whole of the West African craton. And what this tells us is the, um, the age of the source of the uh, magmas in the that um, led to the formation of felsic magmatism across the craton. And so blue we can interpret as being a juvenile source of the magmas and the hotter colors, the reds and the orange, related to more Archean age um, sources of the magmas. And we can see there's uh, some pretty interesting correlations between the most juvenile places uh, which are the blues and the occurrence of gold mineralization. There's also some associated with the older areas, but most of the gold is in the in the juvenile parts of the system. We can also see evidence for reactivation of, of old structures, and there's a couple of examples here. The Boli Nagondi shear zone in northwest Ghana, um, clearly active in the Paleoproterozoic. Uh, based on fish and track work, we believe that it was reactivated during the opening of the Atlantic. So uh, only uh, uh, much younger, 200, 180 million years ago. Similarly, the Kateso shear zone in the center of Ghana, which we can actually follow under the sedimentary basins using the geophysics. We can see that the sedimentary um, basin seismic data is showing that this fault has been reactivated and is offsetting sediments within the basin itself. So there's a lot of interesting work to be done in terms of reactivation of structures at different times, which is interesting both because it uh, provides the possibility of, of younger mineralization events than the, the Paleoproterozoic, but also because it probably helps us to identify which structures are the most important structures um, which are the ones which are most likely to be reactivated during the uh, paleo project. Um, we heavily involve, uh, rely on uh, regional airborne geophysics surveys for our interpretations of the geology. So we're integrating ground geological mapping with airborne geophysics. And on the left hand side is one of the first images from the new Sierra Leone uh, radiometric survey, so gamma ray spectrometry survey, that is clearly uh, allowing us to, to map out the major structures and the major lithological domains. But that data hasn't been fully released yet, so there's a lot more work to do. We've also used that geophysics for analyzing the ages of the mafic dikes in, in West Africa. So these are uh, dolerite dikes and we can see here that the ones that we've, we've dated uh, come in all ages from 200 million years associated with the opening of the Atlantic all the way back to, to 1.7 billion years, so into the um, uh, late Paleoproterozoic and, and Mesoproterozoic. So there's a whole range of different ages showing that there was repeated uh, reactivation of the craton, even though it wasn't deforming uh, enormously, it was uh, repeatedly um, intruded by these mafic dikes of, of all sorts of nations, and that's ongoing work. When we come to the mineral deposits, well, the mineral deposits are, of course, one of the reasons that we're um, focused on West Africa, and it's certainly the reason the companies are there. Here we're looking at, at gold deposits and uh, various different types of of VMSs and porphyry copper across the region. 
Uh, you can see the names of, of a lot of the important deposits. <laughs> the ones that are outlined in red are those deposits which the Waxley project has specifically um, studied in detail and written reports and published on uh, subsequently. So it's covering a good geographic range, although you'll notice that there's not very much in the Archean, and that's definitely the Archean in this in this image is the big grey Kenamad man domain. And we can see that it's it's we haven't done much work there, and that's certainly something for the Archean uh, deposits. And if we then pull apart just the gold story, um, we can see that there's a whole series of so these dots now are just gold deposits, whole series of different um, deposit styles. And we can also we can see that there are different deposit styles and that different styles are characteristic of different geographic regions. So there's a partitioning of uh, gold mineralization styles uh, spatially. We can also see that there's a, a partitioning uh, temporally. So we can see that the the atypical orogenic and intrusion related deposits tend to be later, that there's probably one or two, probably two major orogenic gold phases. There's also a, a, a phase of placer gold deposit formation. And as we, the more we study these different individual deposits, the more we are able to bring them together to look at systematic variations in, in behavior across the craton. And these obviously become important um, tools for understanding how to explore and where to explore. We put all of this together. Um, we've been uh, exploring these, uh, the region, we've been collecting data, we've been harmonizing pre-existing data sets and putting them all into a large uh, GIS database. And this database for many of the uh, important layers with um, attributed age information, sometimes we've had to uh, estimate that obviously because the age information isn't available for everything. We've integrated into a, a large GIS and then out of that large GIS, we've got a subset of information which we've developed something the um, geodynamic atlas. So if we look at the geodynamic atlas, it's showing us the spatial and temporal pollution of West Africa over a 200 million year time period. And you can see the first most obvious thing that we can see is that there's a migration of, of magmatic activity, which are the, the, the red areas of the felsic intrusions. There's a migration of deformation activity, which are those arrows showing shortening directions. Um, there's a, a migration of um, deposits, or that follows a slightly different story, and there's a metamorphic story involved there as well. So over this, using this geodynamic atlas, we can look at the spatial evolution of the, the system, and we can see that there's an east to west migration of activity over most of the 200 million years, um, and that if we take an average uh, migration of this activity, it works out to be something like three centimeters per million years, which is something which is sort of a, a comfortable tectonic speed for uh, the migration of tectonic events across a, a region that was going to become a craton. So it's still very active at this stage. So this geodynamic atlas allows us to, to confirm our suspicions about the, the the overall variations in behavior, but it also allows us for any given mineral deposit to see what the situation was in terms of what rocks were available, what the deformation state was, um, what the metamorphic state was at the time of mineralization. So it gives us a local spatial and temporal context as to what the world looked like. And of course, there are limitations for this analysis, and I'll, and I'll talk about that in a minute. One of the limitations is obviously that this was an active tectonic region, and the current geographic distribution of, of rocks is certainly not what it was back during their formation. Um, and we've, we, we're addressing those questions uh, by, this is work that we, we carried out a workshop at the end of WAXI 3, 
and we're looking at different models for Proterozoic uh, tectonics. And so we, we examined all of the existing models that have been proposed, and there, there are many variations on the proposed models for the tectonics of West Africa. And we, we, we've settled on three that we wanted to examine and compare in more detail. One of them is the model that essentially came out of the Canadian research groups that looks at a, a pre-modern plate tectonic solution where we have something called uh, sag junction, where we have uh, failed uh, subduction zones, and, and possibly they failed because there wasn't enough, um, or there was too much heat, so they were the subducting zone, the subducting plates were too buoyant, they wouldn't go down into the mantle. So we end up with a series of, of failed subduction arcs, which are then, which are caught between uh, two Archean collisional blocks. So that's the first model. The second model was developed principally by Graham Bake and the people working with him. And this is a model which emphasizes the importance of pre existing Archean lithosphere as being controlling the blocks of the the evolution of West Africa and so that the greenstone belts that we see in West Africa today are believed in this model to be the white spaces between these rigid lithospheric blocks in in West Africa at the time. The deformation is still driven by um, subduction zones so it's, so it's got a modern plate tectonics story with, superimposed with pre-existing uh, Archean architecture that was controlling the localization of deformation. And then the final model is one which is taking on uh, an essentially modern plate tectonic uh, analysis uh, using a, a reconstruction software, G-plates, to put together what is remains still a cartoon looking at the, the possible evolution. And we can see this purple block, which is the Archean, coming in as a late indenter into the, the story. So, of course, these are under constrained, all of three of these models, but it was useful for us to explore different tectonic scenarios rather than just assuming that we knew the answer. So, of course, this is only part of the story. And if we think about what the tectonics of West Africa was at the time, we also have to think about what um, was the neighborhood of West Africa at the time. And there are many different um, plate reconstructions at the, the, the time of the Paleoproterozoic, and I'm showing you a few here, but certainly not going to go into detail. But the fundamental conclusion of many of the more recent studies is that we just don't have enough data. And that's one of the reasons, from a scientific perspective, of why we are looking at the Guiana Shield in South America, the map on the bottom left hand corner at the West African Craton um, here. And we have the Guiana Shield here. This reconstruction is not at 2 billion years, but at 200 million years, Pangaea just prior to the opening of the Atlantic Ocean. Of course, what reconstruction we can have for 200 million years may have very little relevance for what was going on 2 billion years ago, but at least it's. Um, gives us a starting point for trying to think about the relationship between those two series of greenstone belts with similar geology, um, similar types of mineralization, but certainly uh, very little constraint on, on what their actual relationship was. And it's quite possible that they were actually nowhere near each other. So I've gone through the um, the major themes in the, the WAXI project, so there's a very strong capacity building theme, both for um, students and for continuing education for professionals within the minerals industry, um, with a series of projects involved in belt scale and, and craton scale, uh, architecture and inheritance, so lithology, structure, stratigraphy, um, metamorphism, geochronology, geochemistry, classical tools, uh, combined with the use of geophysics, both understanding the 3D architecture, but also for mapping the, the surface itself. And then we have a series of, of uh, studies of the mineral systems, 
starting at the deposit, going all the way up to the craton scale variations in, in mineralization. And finally, looking at the, the tectonic setting of the West African craton, um, and certainly something that we're going to do more work on in the future is, is ex examining the models, these tectonic models that we proposed, and seeing what data, additional data we can use. So the Wax the Waxy project is a is a partnership. It's a partnership between the minerals industry, uh, West African governments, West African research organizations, and research partners from Canada, France, uh, Australia, principally. And this is just uh, the sponsors meeting, the last one of the last sponsors meetings that was held in 2018. And we're hoping to start the, the next one in a, in a couple of months time. So the, the sponsors, you know, just to give a repetition, what the sponsor, the industry sponsors get out of it is they get access to, to new ideas, new training, uh, new data sets. Uh, same thing that the geological surveys get. The universities in West Africa get access to uh, um, major data compilations, but also access to uh, support for training and for support for um, early career researchers. And of course, the, the researchers um, outside Africa get access to a really interesting part of the world and um, access to the local knowledge and the local logistical support. As I said, we're also working in South America and South America in many ways is very similar. Um, except um, there are more languages. We're talking about five languages, so English, French, Dutch, uh, Spanish, and Portuguese. So that's a, a challenge in its own right. There's a lot more water in South America, a lot less outcrop. And because of those first three things, there's less known about it. So it's a more of a, a, an early research uh, program that we're running there compared to what we're doing in West Africa. But otherwise, the, the model is the same. Both Waxi and Saxi are run through an organization called Amara Global that's a not for profit that supports collaboration between industry and research partners. So I think I've probably talked for long enough now. So I'll stop there and, and open it up for questions. Mark, it has been a very interesting uh, talk. In fact, it has generated a lot of questions in my mind. Uh, uh, how we can take similar projects in India? Because a lot of data is now available in public domain, and I am sure uh, there are uh, many uh, reasons of taking such a uh, research work in India. But uh, that for some other time, I will discuss with you and um, people at. Amera and how we can formulate a project for India and how we can bring in industry and the system. Uh, let me uh, not take much of others' time in this discussion. So uh, at this, uh, I leave this forum open to everybody. Uh, probably Rajendran sir is here, who has a vast experience with uh, GSI and also with Geological Survey or uh, Society of India. Rajendran sir, uh, would you like to say something? Uh, Sorry, I could uh, I missed some of the part of the presentation because of a phone call in between. I was using my mobile, so, so I was very much keen to listen to the West African uh, uh, setup and exploration program, particularly because I happened to be there in Mali and Guinea for uh, gold exploration for some period. Uh, though it is more than uh, eight nine years over after my visit, I have not gone. Yeah, it has a, a quite a good potential for the mineralization, and uh, I think a similar effort. I don't know whether it will be possible to have in India. Many uh, companies have worked. There have been a collaboration with Australia. There has been collaboration with the BRGM in India. We have tried to find out deposit. For example, if you take the Karnataka Kraton or Tharwar Kraton. Yeah, a lot of work has been done by GSI and uh, private agencies, uh, international organizations, but uh, we could not uh, get any uh, major uh, deposit. 
particularly if you look at uh, the main gold producing center was uh, Kolar gold field with KGF there. Uh, we have been trying since uh, 70s uh, to see whether we could be able to locate another deposit similar to the one in the KGF, which has produced more than 800 tons of gold. But we could not uh, uh, find any similar one. And the same is the situation in many of the green sets belts. Though we have a number of gold deposits, but uh, we could not uh, get one which could be mined uh, uh, except for the Hatti, which is continuing to produce some gold. So I don't know whether the uh, experiments carried out in West Africa will be able to make an experiment here in Indian situation, particularly the uh, arcane setup in the southern uh, Indian terrain. And even eastern one where you have both arcane as well as Protrozoic, where there is no major gold producing, except now only one situation is there in Aravalli, that is Protrozoic, where you have some carbonate-hosted gold mineralization. Uh, that is what maybe we can uh, find his views about the Indian situation, whether any possibilities uh, there. Thank you, Mr. Karnagar, for the opportunity to give me to present uh, you my views. Many sides so important. Uh, I have Devrajan said, would you like to say something? Uh, said, I, I would like to hear from all the experts who are here what they think and can this uh, similar project uh, with in association with universities and industries maybe under Geological Society of India or maybe under any other uh, uh, banner. Can we think of uh, doing something which is off? Because there's a lot of regional scale data is available now in India. So can we do uh, these kind of uh, studies uh, as a research projects and, and grow the knowledge of the industry? Uh, even um, Samuel, sir, you can come in because you also have the experience with uh, various organizations working worldwide. Yeah, only Geological Society of India can play a role as a, a platform where we can uh, have a training program organized uh, and then have a collaboration with GSI and then have a program if at all possible. We can plan about yeah. a week or 10 days or maybe something like that in Karnataka Kratan. Yes, yeah, sir. I mean, GSI, Geological Society of India can be a facilitator for having these kind of platforms because it's, it's a uh, well-respected uh, organization across the country and people know uh, are everybody's member of it almost mm. um, mark my name is abani samal um um am i audible uh, mr karnaka yes sir yes 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 um i have a comment and two questions i i apologize i've, I've been listening to you um is this um what I see that overall your projects are this really focused towards uh, you know precious metals and base metals, because when you look at the Western uh, African craton, I mean, there are a lot of massive um, you know uh, uh, deposits like uh, iron ore, yeah bauxite. You did mention about the bauxite, uh, but uh, you know what is Guinea? I mean it's it's uh, we shouldn't say it's world class. I mean there's no we don't try to be actually don't don't try to actually uh, classify as world class because it is world class. It is actually gigantic um, Guinean uh, bauxite, and so is so is also iron ore. But what also surprised me when I went to further, um, uh, you know, east of your study area in Nigeria, the rest of the world almost did not know or do, uh, do not know about it. Um, the potential in that country are if, if you go from Nigeria to in the West, that whole uh, whole area. I mean, I don't know how you put the boundary on this side and that that that, that craton. But if you if you extend towards um, towards <coughs> east, you see there's a lot of potential in those countries. I don't believe in the <coughs> political there. If you look at take the political boundaries out, you see only geology. This is a continuous of, of mineralization. We talk about similar type of geology in Nigeria too. Um, so that's kind of my comment. Uh, really interesting um, uh, 
presentation mark. Thank you for that. My question is, uh, is this data that you're generating, um, is this uh, available on, on public domain or is it uh, available for um, for the response? Particularly, are these available for the federal governments in those countries? Thank you for your for your first comment. Yes, I mean, clearly the the aluminium and iron ore deposits in, in Guinea and in Liberia, Sierra Leone are massive and they're they're they they sort of they live in a, their own little world to a certain extent. And we have had uh, several base metal sponsors, but we must admit that most of our sponsors are looking for gold. So we've had Rio Tinto in the past, we've had First Quantum in the past, but in the end, they, they, to a certain extent, they already know where the iron ore and the gold is, uh, iron ore and the aluminium is. It's not a secret where the bauxite deposits are. It's not a secret where the, the um, iron ore deposits are. In the same way that looking for gold is much more uh, uh, greenfields exploration, even in an area like West Africa, that's fairly well, by now, reasonably well explored. But I think it's you know what one of the things that we've been very interesting is that when we started in 2006, West Africa, everybody knew there was gold there, but there were countries like Burkina Faso that literally had zero deposits, gold deposits running at the time. They had Pocoa, which right. was zinc. And then, but since then, people have gone, oh, look, it's actually full of gold. So it's, it, you know, the same thing will certainly happen in Nigeria, probably in Gabon, um, Cameroon, um, we're, we're certainly extending further east than we've gone in the past, so we've, we're going to be working in Togo and Benin. We're probably going to stop short of Nigeria this time, just because it's it's already a huge area, and Nigeria is, uh, you know, Nigeria probably so, needs to be part of its own project rather than being tacked on to ours. But with, there's somebody in the next stage of the Waxi project who definitely wants to. Um, understand the iron ore deposits better in West Africa. And so if he can find an iron ore company that's willing to support that work, that will then become part of the WAXI, the next stage of the WAXI project. In terms of your actual question, so all I agree with all your comments. In terms of your question, um, we've published, most of the data by now is published. So the, the difference between what the sponsors have access to and what the general public has access to is that the sponsors have access to the data all nicely packaged up in a GIS. And I can, I can, they're basically, I, it's something I didn't really talk about, but I can share the screen just to give you a brief idea of what that looks like. Um, if we skip the, so you can see a, a map on the screen yeah. again now. So this is, we, we provide the data in two forms to all, not just the sponsors, but also the universities and geological surveys all have access to this data. But this is password protected because this is the, this is what we're selling to the companies in a sense. But essentially this is, a, we provide it all as a GIS, so ARC, GIS, MapInfo, QGIS, but we also provide it all online so that this data for example, showing the um, the geochronological data for West Africa, um, it allows us to update the data more frequently than with, with a traditional GIS. Um, and there's a whole series of layers. There's something like 130 layers that are available that anybody that's part of the project can access online. And so that gives us a very dynamic way of providing the, the data to our partners. But it's uh, and they can download it from this website. They can get everything they need from there. Um, it's all. And so yeah, thank you. and then sorry, once I, a year. Yeah, once ahead. a year sorry. we we no, no, that's sorry. Once a year we provide them with a new hard disk. But after two or three years, the way that we organize the project is that the confidentiality finishes at the end of the project. Two years after the project, we can publish anything we want. So from an academic point of view, that's really important that it's not locked up in reports that will never see the light of day. We're allowed to publish it, we're allowed to publish the data. And so in a sense, what the companies have is they have a, 
a head start on access to the data. They get it before everybody else, and they get it nicely packaged up into a GIS. But that's that's the only difference. I think you know the Mark. The reason I asked that question, I kind of knew you know the Western Western Australian database. You go to you know in Canada the BC database. This is all actually works like that. You have to have a sponsor. And if if I pay a hundred bucks, I have to have access to that, right? Mm -hmm. You know, that's you know, it's, it, this is then I think the clarifies to Mr. Korangaran's uh, um, his uh, comment on this. You know, yes, the data will be av available, but when the data is generated over a long period of time, it has a value. It has to be recouped somehow. But doing through the research pro to your research program is probably a different type of thing. Sorry, uh, I'll, I'll have two more small comments. The first thing actually, you know, the comment actually that Rajendran sir said, you know, you may be knowing actually, Mark, there are uh, in Guinea, um, World Bank is already sponsoring projects. They're there for many years. And uh, in Nigeria, they're doing it. So basically, World Bank has a focus on, on mineral industry um, uh, kind of based project that they know that that region can get enriched if they develop the mineral resources. I see more than one project. I just mentioned two, there are two or three other countries I know. World Bank is sponsoring for a region. And in those countries, actually, uh, Mark, it, maybe you may be knowing this thing, they're developing the geological data too. So you mentioned about Nigeria. So the Min Diaper project is already developing that project. They're not, they don't have the GIS database that you have. They're much younger uh, project. Yours is a, how long is it decade, right? About a 10 years old, right? 15. But they are 15 years. I mean, Min Diaper is hardly like three, four, five years project. They would, mm. would just develop at least, you know, fast layers of uh, very preliminary uh, kind of exploration data. So I think comments like Rajendran sir, the, the comment that, that you made, and uh, also the friends in India, all these things that we see where there's a rich database is uh, developing with the help of either research institutions and uh, or mean, uh, you know, World Bank type of agencies. There's a one com common observation that I have. It's a long-term collaboration, always long-term collaboration, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, you, because our world is not that simple. You go and explore and, and collect the data and make it available. I think, you know, in India, we have to do this thing. This is need, need to be, need to have a long-term commitment from India side also. You know, you know, we do a lot of short courses, a lot of knowledge, knowledge sharing, that's all good. But when we go to at least, you know, for long-term exploration, we have to have long-term collaboration with any agency in the world, it doesn't really matter, but we have to have a long-term collaboration. That's that's all I have to say. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, uh, Data Code. Uh, just to introduce uh, for people who don't uh, know uh, Aguni, he is uh, uh, ISM pass out, but he's based in US and he's consultant to World Bank on many projects and he's involved uh, independently for various uh, consulting and research projects, uh, especially on the financial modeling. So uh, that's his Thank expertise. You. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you guys thanks. have enjoyed the day, day time up. It's like 11.30 my time. In <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, just thanks, opposite okay. to the box times. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thanks for that. And thanks for, for taking the time because, yeah, I agree with you completely. A lot of the um, geophysical data sets that we use in West Africa, which we have access to thanks to the partnerships with the surveys, was either funded by the World Bank, well, was supported by the World Bank or by the European Union. And we're actually in discussions at the moment with the World Bank to see whether there's some partnership that we can have because we, you know, we've, we, we, we do things, you know, what, one of the differences between what we do and the World Bank does is the World Bank because of the way that they're set up, only works with one country at a time. Whereas we have the luxury of being able to look at the whole region simultaneously. So there's, you know, they they have lots of money, but we are, have access in a way that they don't. So it, it's it's you know, one other thing Mark, you should know. Mark, Mark, there's one other thing you should know when you're dealing with the World Bank. If you're receiving money from World Bank directly, once your data is available, it's going to be public. 
That's Enough. fine. Yeah. 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 There's no way yeah, we can stop that. All, all, all of our data ends up being public. Because it's, it's, um, if, if, I learned it in a, in a different way. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if we're, we're academics. So if we don't publish, we don't have a job anymore. So it's, it's, it's in our interest to publish. <laughs> Absolutely right. Uh, any other questions or suggestions, please uh, feel free to ask or raise your hands. Uh, Devarajan here. Yes, sir, please. Um, I have joined this session from Mali. Uh, it is 5.30 morning here uh, from a remote uh, gold exploration camp near Ivory Coast border. And first of all, uh, I congratulate Data Code and Mark for coming together for uh, this session. And um, uh, as an exploration geologist, uh, I find one of the major challenges which uh, we face in exploration in, in a country like Mali for gold is in um, identifying the right targets or, or selecting the right targets. And it is there that the work which is being carried out by organizations like AMERA and um, uh, uh, that is VAXI is of tremendous help uh, because it is the different data sets the integration of various data sets which uh, these organizations are creating or have created uh, and together with the success the tools which were used by the um, industries in their successful campaigns uh, it is all these together which have to be used in identifying um, the right targets so the work which is being carried out by waxi um, in in creating leads in creating in identifying new targets is of tremendous uh, significance and i also join the others who have commented earlier that uh, similar uh, collaborative projects between the industry and the academia are very very important uh, in the indian context too and um, we hope long-term sustainable projects like this are taken up by the Indian government, academia, uh, and the industry uh, so that um, we also uh, develop our mineral industry in, in a far better way than it is currently uh, in. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. For a, for a wonderful presentation and showing you uh, a glimpse of the data. I, I am one of the benef beneficiaries. <laughs> thank you so much. Good. And, and thank you for that comment, because it, it's, it's true that one of the strength of the projects by now is that it has been going on for a long time. And if it, one pro you know, the first project was a pilot project. It just lasted a year. Um, the second one was three years, the third one was four years, the next one's going to be three years. And you need that continuity of research and working with uh, essentially the same research team over most of that time. Because for one thing, it builds up personal relationships with all of the different geological surveys, with the industry, but also between the researchers. But also it gives you the opportunity to support uh, African students from their masters through their PhDs and as they go into either into industry or into academia and so that they actually can become part of the next generation of, of researchers in the area. So the, the, the working together for that period of time has been allowed us to fill in gaps in our knowledge in the region, but it's also allowed us to build these really long term relationships. Both aspects are important. And just coming back to what Thank KK you. was saying, I'd be very happy to to have discussions with you as to what model we could look at for, for India. Yeah, 
yeah, that is for some other time, Mark. But yes, I yeah, will absolutely. come. To come back to you because this is something mm-hmm. is exciting. And fortunately, we are getting into one more project for state of Orissa, where I will have a more free hand to discuss that. So that could be a area where we, we have a five years relationship with state of Orissa in that contract. So, and, and we are, have access to the basic data also. So Excellent. I think something we can, and on the similar lines, we could generate a project or a research project or something. Like that. I have something in mind. Great. I think thanks, Mark, uh, and everybody for attending this session. It's been interesting. It's been, uh, uh, you know, enlightening and thought provoking. I really appreciate everybody taking out time and listening to Mark. And uh, uh, Mark, uh, yeah. as always, has been a good friend of the industry, and uh, now he's also being good friend to us in India and helping us to understand technology and other research aspects. Uh, thank you, Mark, for taking our time. And the next presentation will be once again on the second Saturday of next month, that's June 11, uh, by Devrajan, sir. Uh, he will be uh, doing the next uh, session uh, on the second Saturday. So I would invite all of you to join and listen to his expo- experience and knowledge, gain the knowledge from his work. That's gold exploration in covered uh, terrains, insights from West African cretons. Uh, so that's where uh, Devrajan sir will be speaking. And uh, I think it should be interesting talk for all of us in continuity with today's talk. Thanks one and all. Thanks, Mark. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. Really good discussion. See you soon. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you, Karnada. Thank you, sir. Thank you. See you next uh, meeting. Yes, sir. Yes.